Ace, England women's player. Um, I think you played over a hundred times in all formats for England. Yes. Which is quite a good stint, isn't it, for, for, for the women's group? Yeah, um, I had a ten-year uh, playing career. Um, started when I was 17, and then I retired a couple of years ago. Um, not so many test matches in there because the women don't play as many. Uh, it was the, the focus was generally on one day internationals, and then obviously um, from I think it was 2000. And, Three or four, that's when we started playing the T20. Yeah, so, sort of taken over now. Yeah, it? it is. What kind of shape is women's cricket in right now? It's in a pretty good shape, actually. Um, the men had a pretty disappointing winter, but the women did quite well. They, they won two back to back Ashes um, and obviously went to the World T20, got to the finals. They lost to Australia in the finals, they didn't play so well. But um, it's really thriving at the moment uh, in terms of the fact that actually. Um, in recent, in the last few weeks, um, the ECB have just announced that the girls have gone professional, um, which is a huge step uh, in women's cricket in general, globally. Um, they're the first team uh, to go professional, um, and I think it's something like 18 of the, the players have been awarded contracts. Um, you might need to check that fact. But, um, so, so when you say professional, does that mean they are basically earning enough money they're earning to enough survive, that they, yeah. that they are fully professional? Yeah, that's right. So they're earning enough money now to be able to train and play cricket all year round. Um, and we didn't think that would happen for another 10, 15, 20 years. So for it to happen now is timely, I think, um, because when I was playing, certainly towards the end of my career, I was really struggling to, to be able to fit everything in because we were semi-professional. We obviously had the support from Chance to Shine, which was unbelievable. Um, I think something like eight or nine of the girls had the opportunity to maybe work 20 to 30 hours coaching in schools around the country um, and that allowed them to have understanding employee, uh, employers uh, and be able to play cricket at the same time. But um, I personally chose to, to go down a different route. I, um, I decided, I don't know why, decided to take up a PhD um, part-time and I was starting to struggle in terms of the demands of that cricket was placing on me in terms of going away and being able to train and be fully fit um, and have the skill levels required to play at the highest level. Um, and I think it was the same for a lot of the girls. So I think this is now, you know, obviously a wonderful opportunity for them. And hopefully now other countries around the world will follow. I was going to ask you that. How do you think women's cricket will develop from here on in? Are there going to be other countries that are going to be able to challenge the dominance of Australia and England? Do you think? I believe so. Um, Australia are also really well supported and um, I think the likes of the West Indies, Sri Lanka and South Africa are getting a lot of support from their governing bodies which um, they're now you can start to see the benefits of it. They're reaping the rewards in the, in the world, at the world stage and that they're starting to beat the bigger sides, certainly in the 2020 game where it is a little bit more of a lottery. Um, the West Indies look a very dominant force in 2020 cricket, you would have seen them play. Um, I think more support could come for the India side from the BCCI. Um, I generally think that they've got a, a wealth of talent in their squad, it's just they haven't quite gone to that next level. In fact, they're probably slipping down a little bit. Um, and they just need someone to take it by the scruff of their neck, inject some money and support into the game. Um, and I think that they will start to thrive. Well, they're over here, aren't they, this summer? They're, they're playing England. Uh, how do you see that series going? Um, it'll be an interesting series. I think England, um, they would have wanted to have won that World T20 final. So they're coming off the back of that. They would have had a, a, a bit of a break. Um, and a chance to play a lot of county cricket and they'll be going into that series feeling very fresh indeed. Playing at home is always an advantage. Um, India coming over, they've traditionally always been better in the longer formats. Um, I think in 2020 cricket they, they haven't quite found the right formula in terms of how to play so it'll be interesting to see how they get on but they have some really talented players um, in their squad. You would have heard of the likes of Natali Raj um, who really is one of the most elegant batsmen I've ever seen. She played on Monday at Lords, in fact, for the rest of the world game against uh, an MCC 11, and I think she scored a 60 off 65 balls or something. Um, really talented cricketer, uh, and she's been playing the game for, for maybe 10 years now. Same as Julanga Swami, 
who is a fellow Bengali girl, and uh, she you know, bowls with a lot of pace, a lot of accuracy. Um, and they've got another young girl coming through called Harman Preet Kaur, who, if you look at the parallels of the game, I actually think that women's cricket, there are a lot of parallels with the men's game, um, in that the English girls would be very technically correct. Um, the Indian player is very wristy, uh, very stylish. Uh, the Australian player is very strong. They like to hit it big. Um, the and the West Indians, yeah, they, they have a lot of flair and passion about their game. Um, and Harman Preet Kaur uh, really does remind me of Royal Dravid. She, uh, she, it's just the way she plays. You look at her style and her technique and it looks exactly like he, he does. So, um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of exciting cricketers to look forward to. You can probably watch those live on Sky, I think, a couple of those. Yes, you can. <laughs> I might well be doing September, them. yeah. <laughs> September, I think it's the 3rd and the 6th six, or the 7th, something like that. Yeah. So. No, look, look forward to that, especially yeah. the, the female round down. I've seen <laughs> yeah. before. Um, as far as your own career is concerned, how did you start in the game? Who are your biggest influences? Um, well, uh, I used to watch a lot of cricket on television, and coming from an Asian background, I think it was pretty much instilled in me. Um, my parents were always talking about it. My dad used to go to Eden Gardens and he'd climb up the trees to watch um, the games um, going on there. And obviously it holds 100,000 people, so he would tell me about the atmosphere and, and everything. Um, and when I was over here, obviously there's a lot of English cricket on television, and this might surprise you, but my hero growing up was Darren Goff. Um, I used to just, <laughs> I've met him now, so it's, uh, it's changed a little bit. <laughs> <Not at all. laughs> um, but yeah, I just used to love his charisma and the way he always used to make something happen on the pitch, whether it was with the bat or with the ball. Um, and I really kind of admired that quality in him, that typical Barnsley quality. And it's the same with Catherine Brunt, in fact. Yeah. I used to really enjoy playing with her because she just had this air of confidence about her, a little bit of arrogance, um, and she just, you know, wears her heart on her sleeve, and I used to really enjoy that, that aspect of cricket, and that's something that I always try to emulate when I went out and played on, on the cricket field, so, yeah, it was very much just watching it on television, my brother used to play a lot um, in the back garden, we used to play a bit of tape ball cricket, in fact, but we'd tape up half of the tennis ball so it would swing, um, but we had like a, a long... Uh, our back garden was quite long and thin, so it was perfect for, for playing cricket. It was cricket. a net, basically. It was basically a net, yeah. <laughs> the greenhouse got smashed a few times, that wasn't happening. <laughs> so were your parents pretty supportive then, you play? They were really supportive. Um, and I, at that time, I think that was quite rare for parents to be supportive of a female playing cricket. Um, I grew up in quite a westernised society. Um, we didn't really have too much family around at the time, so it was more just friends of my parents that we'd go and see in terms of Asians. <coughs> and they introduced me, I actually started playing at the local cricket club at High Wycombe with the boys, um, and I think my dad had a few things to say about it to my mum, but she kind of convinced him that it would be okay. Um, and I yeah, went along, it was the same club that my brother played, played at, and I just really enjoyed it. Um, I was probably a bit nervous at the start, but they really embraced me. And I think for girls at that age, at the age of eight, it's, it's a lot easier to start playing boys cricket then because the, the standard is the same. You're just learning the technical aspects of the game. The strength really isn't there at that point. It's only when you get to the age of 14, 15, when they start to take over, they, they come a bit quicker um, and they start to hit out of the park a little bit more. But um, I think for me, in terms of my confidence, that's where I gained a lot of it through playing with the boys. Because as soon as I transferred into women's cricket, I felt that I could take on anyone. Um, and it wasn't just in cricket. And I think this is the beauty of the sport is that it gave me the confidence going into school um, to be able to talk to boys and feel that I could talk to anyone really um, and hold my own um, as a youngster and as a teenager. So um, I think it helped my development not not only on the pitch but off the pitch. How about young British Asian girls playing the game, are there more and more nowadays? Yeah, I, I've, I've always seen a lot of young British Asians playing the game, whether it's um, part of school, whether it's with their families, um, a, a lot of 
girls generally play a lot of family cricket in the back garden at the local park. Um, but it's only when you get to the ages of 16 and 17 when education starts to take over and maybe pressures from parents, as Wazi mentioned earlier, where they have to start to focus and channel their um, thoughts towards going to university, having an education, getting a proper job, becoming a doctor. Um, <laughs> and so it's doctor, right? <laughs> yeah, doctor, doctor or dentist or something like that. Um, but my, the message that I always try to get across was that it is possible to do both. I started playing for England when I was 17, I was still at school. Um, and I went to university, got a degree, and I carried on doing research. Um, and I was still able to play cricket for England. And I think as long as you prioritise your time well, um, I think it's possible to do both. I really do. Now you're a TV presenter. Yeah, I don't know how that <laughs> happened. After PhD. How are you enjoying it? Yeah, I really am. Um, it came about as an opportunity, really, just out of nowhere. About four years ago, um, ITV got in touch with me on Twitter. Um, the lady that did it the year before had fallen pregnant, so they needed someone to come in and, and do a job. And um, It was two weeks before the IPL started on ITV4. Um, <clears throat> And I was pretty nervous. I had one screen test and I was straight in there. And uh, before I first went on air, the director said to me, Oh, Isha, don't worry, it's fine. You've only got half a million people watching. <laughs> and literally, I was petrified. Literally, underneath, I was petrified. But I just tried to embrace the opportunity. And so you're pretty brave doing that. I mean, I, you know, I had a bit more training before I got chucked in to do something like yeah. two weeks' notice or yeah. something like that with half a million people watching. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that it, was, it was pretty full on. I was, uh, it was a baptism of fire. And I think the only thing that really got me through was my cricket knowledge and the fact that I knew that <coughs> I could talk about it. Um, everything else kind of just came after. And four years on, I feel like I have developed a little bit more and I feel a lot more confident on, on television. So. so it comes across. <laughs> Thanks. Um, IPL, I mean, I've got to be honest with you. I've, I watch it a bit enviously. I wish I was doing it, to be honest. Um, must be a great tournament to work in. It is. It's, uh, it's one of the, well, it's the flagship T20 tournament in the world um, at the moment, you know, just full of buzz and razzmatazz, and they've got this perfect sort of, it merges well with Bollywood in a way, in terms of they get the Bollywood stars down, they have the cheerleaders there. It really is a spectacle. And when you're actually out in India, it's, something completely different. You touch down on the ground and it's in your face straight away on all the billboards, on, in all the papers, on, um, on all the news programmes. And uh, I went to a game last year, I think it was Mumbai versus Rajasthan Royals uh, at the Bankadi Stadium. And honestly, it just felt like a rave. Like you were at the ground and everyone was on their feet, just literally jumping up and down after every shot, whether it was a single or a leg bite or whatever, literally everyone was just um, up and down. You really can't, you can't imagine the atmosphere until you're actually there. But to be able to work on it is, is pretty special. Um, I've been able to talk to, to guests that you know, I, I admired growing up. Clive Lloyd's been on the show <coughs> uh, since a few years back. We had Jeffrey in the other day, which was amusing. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he wasn't too bad, actually. He had a few things to say, but um, I didn't trip him up with the old, oh, how would you have gone in 2020 cricket? Um, but yeah, no, it was, you know, it's been a, a fantastic experience. And obviously, as a tournament, I think it's great to be able to have the best players playing together um, in the same team. I just think it makes it really attractive. Um, so, yeah. Who's going to win it this year? Kings Eleven are looking pretty good. I don't know if you guys have been watching it, but... Um, They've been the real surprise team of the tournament uh, this year, and Glenn Maxwell was very much the, the leader of that at the start. He smashed a bucket load of runs in the first three or four games, but it's now about uh, the rest of the team, and they've got these really young Indian players coming through the system, which is what it's all about as well, uh, to encourage the young Indian players who haven't played for India to, to be able to perform on the big stage against the, the best cricketers. Um, there's a young lad called Sandeep Sharma, who gets the ball to swing away yeah. and in, yeah, with control, picks up a, a lot of wickets. Um, and the spinners on show as well, I think, you know, it is, a, it is a real shame that we can't have more English players over there because the amount of 
experience that they would get from playing in that competition would be immense. Um, obviously, we understand that the, the schedules can't, um, they don't sort of, it crosses over a little bit with the English county season and, and obviously the test matches and stuff. So it can't really happen, but um, it, I would like to see it. Are you a Kolkata fan? I am. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, and they're doing a lot better now. Um, they're fourth in the table at the moment. And uh, obviously their franchise owner is Shah Rukh Khan, so uh, that's always good. <laughs> I had the opportunity to meet him a couple of years ago. That was, um, yeah, I don't normally get a starstruck, but I did with him. <laughs> yeah, I understand why. <laughs> uh, 